Okay, now we come to our second talk. Belinda, my colleague from Strasbourg, from the IGPMC, will uh, talk about the treatments and the therapies because she's working on the development of therapies and the results are quite uh, great and I'm always impressed. <laughs> thank you. Uh, okay, so thank you very much firstly to the organizers for giving me the chance to present uh, our work to you today. Um, I'm really happy to be here for the first time. Unlike Yo and I haven't been to the last four meetings, this is my first time, so I'm very happy to be here. And uh, at any stage in the next day or two, if you see me, if you want to ask a question, I'm, I'm happy to, to discuss, to try and answer any questions. Uh, I'm here. So, like Yoan, I work at the IGBMC. I have the same picture here that he just showed you. And this is our lab. So we work with the big boss, which is Jocelyn, who discovered the MTM1 gene 20 years ago. And as Johan described to you, in the lab, uh, we have several different areas of research. So we have a link with the diagnostic clinic in um, near where we are, which has a link to the patients and trying to identify new genes. So to identify these new genes, Johan is the person to come to. After we identify these new genes, we want to try and understand why they cause the disease. So that's the part of the work that Anne-Sophie is looking at. And she tries to understand uh, how this causes disease, both in cells, in a petri dish, and in animals. So I mainly work with mice, and my job is to use these animals to try and understand the disease and to try and find new therapies that we really hope one day will make it back to patients in a clinical trial and further. So that's our overall uh, structure and how we work. Now to describe just a little bit to you um, how therapies can work. So a patient may have a missing or mutated protein such as myotubularin in the case of myotubular myopathy. So one way to try and uh, cure this disease is to try and replace what's missing. So you could do something where you try and replace the gene, so what's coding for the protein, the instruction manual, as Johan said. So gene therapy is something that I think Casey and Anna will present to you later today. They have some fantastic results with the dog. Uh, enzyme replacement is another option. So what this means is basically you're trying to replace what's missing. So in this case, they're trying to replace the myotubularin protein. And this is, I think, Valerion that's been working on this. Uh, after this, we have another option. So rather than replacing what's missing, we can try and fix the network. So you as a person are not by yourself, you have family, you have friends, you have a support system, everybody is around you. So just like that, my tubularin and other proteins in the cell don't work alone. They work with a network of proteins. So what we can try and do is play on this network, modify this network to try and fix the problem. So one option is playing on the function of myotubularin as an enzyme. So I think Jim is going to explain a little bit about this to you later. And in our lab, one of the things we're trying to do is play with Dynamin 2 or DNM2. And we call this cross therapy. So just to describe this a little bit more, basically we believe in a cell that you need to have a nice balance between MTM1 and Dynamin 2 for normal muscle function. If you somehow play on this balance, like in the case of myotubular myopathy, where you have little or no MTM1, it throws the scales out of whack. And what happens is you have an increase in this dynamin 2. It's overactive, it's overfunctioning, and so the balance is, is not where it should be. So what we propose to do is try and bring this balance back to a normal level where the muscle can function by reducing the dynamin 2. So basically that's what we've done. So firstly, we started with a mouse that has no MTM1. So in this case, it's Mickey Mouse, but it's basically a model of a mouse that's like myotubular myopathy. And what we said is, okay, we're going to try and reduce Dynamin 2 in this mouse. So we did this by taking a mouse that has less Dynamin 2. We crossed the two mice together, and we came up with this mouse at the end that has no NTM1 and less Dynamin 2. In this case, we're trying to balance the scales back to the middle. And so you'll see a video here. There are three mice in the cage. So there's a normal mouse. There's a mouse that has no MTM1, and there's a mouse that has no MTM1 and less Dynamin 2. So probably you can guess that this mouse here is eight weeks of age, 
uh, is the one that has no MTM1. And what's quite interesting, I think, from this video is that you probably can't see a difference between these two mice here. And so we find that these mice are really, really healthy, even though they don't have MTM1, by reducing the amount of dynamin 2. So this is just the answer to the puzzle if you didn't get it. No MTM1, and here are the two other mice here. So let's just look a little bit more at what these mice can do. So this is a test we do. It looks a bit cruel, but it's not. They're only falling a tiny amount. We try and ask the mouse to put his hind limbs up onto a string. And you can see the mouse with no MTM1 is not able to do the test. When we reduce Dynamin2 in this mouse, he's a little bit lazy. We've got to get him motivated a bit. But you can see eventually, <laughs> there we go, <laughs> he can get his hind limbs up onto the string. So he's able to perform the test with no problems. So not only is he OK and he walks around the cage, he can do experiments that involve uh, using his whole body. Another test that we do in the lab is we try and get the mouse to hang from the lid of a cage. So the idea of this is that the mouse has to be strong enough to support his whole body weight. And you can see without MTM1 that the mouse, as soon as he has to support his body weight, is unable to hold on and he falls off. When we reduce Dynamin2 in this mouse, you can see that the mouse has no problems at all. So he's able to hold on to the cage, he's looking around, he's exploring, and he's able to do it uh, quite easily. So at this stage, we were pretty happy, but we wanted to try and quantify um, these experiments. So here we have something. Oh, you can't see that. There we go. So we measured the force. So that means the strength of the muscle in these mice. And what we found, so in blue, you have the strength of a normal mouse. In red, you have the strength of a mouse that has no MTM1. And in green, you have the strength of a mouse when we reduce Dynamin2. And what you can see is not only does he past the strength of an MTM1 mouse, but it goes all the way almost to a normal level. So we can drastically improve the strength in these mice. And another very important thing, of course, is survival. So you have a normal mouse survival here. We measure up to 24 months of age, so two years. A mouse that has no MTM1 normally survives around four to five months maximum. What you can see is that when we reduce Dynamin2, the survival of this mouse increases as well quite dr drastically all the way to around 24 months as well. So maybe 24 months doesn't mean much, but if you calculate mouse years in terms of human years, we're equivalent to about 70 years. So these mice that normally only survive a few months were able to survive up to the equivalent of 70 human years. So we're quite happy with that. So basically, if we take a step back and just summarize what I've shown you so far, in myotubular myopathy, we think that this balance between MTM1 and Dynamin2 is a little bit out of whack. So what we try to do is reduce Dynamin2 and bring this balance back to a normal state where the muscle can function. So the question we asked after this is whether or not a similar imbalance is occurring in centronuclear myopathy. So not due to MTM1, but due to different gene mutations. In centronuclear myopathies, is there an imbalance? And could this reduction of Dynamin2 work for another centronuclear myopathy? So the next thing we did is we tried that approach with a gene called BIN1. So as most of you know, BIN1 is also mutated in centronuclear myopathy. So the question we asked is, if we reduce Dynamin2, can we rescue this disease? So what we did, this time we took Minnie Mouse, so we have centronuclear myopathy due to BIN1 mutations. We have a mouse that has no BIN1 expressed in the cells. And this mouse has a very severe phenotype and has a, a strong reduction in the life expectancy. So what we did is we crossed this mouse with a mouse that has less Dynamin2. So here we have BIN1 missing and reduced Dynamin2. So the question is, do we as well improve, firstly, the survival? So here you can see the survival of a normal mouse. As I said, the survival is drastically reduced when there's no BIN1 in the cell. When we look at the mouse that has less Dynamin2, you can see that the survival increases up to the full length that we measured, which was 18 months. So we stopped the experiment at this age. It may have gone further. But 18 months is equivalent to 64 human years. So we were as well able to improve the life expectancy in these mice by reducing Dynamin2. So 
to give you a little look at these mice, Here's two mice. One of these mice is a, a mouse is a normal mouse that has a normal expression of bin one. The other mouse has no bin one, no dynamin two. So it's a centronucleomyopathy mouse with reduced dynamin two. And probably what you can see is the mice move quite happily around the cage without any problems. Of course, we don't have a video of the bin one mouse because he did not survive until 12 months of age. So this was a normal and this was the, the mouse with less dynamin 2. Basically, the mice survive and they appear healthy. When we look at the strength of the muscle, you can see that compared to a normal mouse, which is very strong, the, bin, the mouse without bin 1, we couldn't measure, this, measure the strength because they don't survive long enough. In a mouse that has reduced dynamin 2, they're very strong. And in fact, in this case, they were as strong even slightly stronger sometimes than the normal mice. So to summarize what I've shown you so far, what you can see is that in cases due to MTM1, so we had a mouse that has no MTM1 expressed in the muscles, in all the cells of the body. When we reduced dynamic 2, we were able to rescue the mouse phenotype. So the mice survived, they were healthy and they were strong. When we did the same thing with a mouse that has no BIM1 expression, so in the case of central nuclear myopathy, we reduced dynamic 2 and we were as well able to rescue the phenotype in these mice. So, so far we have two forms of the disease that we're able to rescue in mice by reducing dynamic 2. So the next step and what we're currently working on is the dynamic 2 case. So here we have uh, a mouse um, which it has a model of the disease, so it has the disease in its muscle. So what we're trying to do now is we're trying to take this mouse that has a dynamic 2 mutation reduce dynamin 2 and see as well if we can uh, improve or correct the phenotype in this mice. So that's what we're doing at the minute. Hopefully next time I see you we'll be able to present some of these results. And so now I think I have another two minutes. So uh, the next step of course is to talk about how we could potentially reduce dynamin 2 in patients because it's one thing to reduce it genetically but we can't do that in the clinic. So if we take a step back we can see as Johan nicely explained, you have a chromosome, and in the chromosome are many, many genes. And a gene uh, is what carries the information for the protein. So we could say it's like the manual for building a car. This gene, like the manual for the car, is responsible for making the protein. The protein is what has a function or activity in the cell. So we could say that the protein is like a car. So in this case, we'll count dynamin 2 as a red Ferrari. So what we could do, we have two possibilities to try and reduce dynamin 2 in the cell. One is at the gene level. So at this level here, we can try and reduce dynamin. So the way we can do that, there we go, is by blocking the manual. And if we do that, we don't have the instructions to make the car. The second option, is to try and block dynamin 2 at the protein level. So in this case, we want to block the red Ferrari, as you can see there, and slow it down. So we don't want to get rid of the red Ferrari because we still need the car to move. We just want to reduce it. We want to slow it down to something a bit slower. So here we have the example of uh, Catrell, I think. I don't know the same name in English. It's Johan's favorite car, and I believe it's actually a photo of his car. It doesn't quite go as fast as a red Ferrari, but it still works pretty well. So that's our goal. And I think we're fortunate in a way um, that if we find one of these approaches that can work to reduce dynamin 2, that we have many animal models that have been developed, a lot of them by people in this room, to test these approaches in preclinical trials, with the idea, of course, of going to clinical trials. And one thing to keep in mind is that you'll see many approaches today. Um, if these approaches work, there's no reason why they couldn't be combined with other therapies to have an even better effect in the clinic. So overall, we really hope to try and work together to get something to go through to the clinic. And so with that, I'm just about on time. I have the nice photo of the heart that you saw before. As I said, Jocelyn is the, the boss of the team. We have a few people here highlighted that have been working on this work. And one thing I want to say, so we have a few people that have helped support this work. Um, very importantly, my tubular trust, if I have 30 seconds, have been supporting our lab for years. And I think that we're really lucky to have a, a patient foundation that 
is supporting the work. So firstly, I think they're motivated by all of you that are really um, motivated to come out, to come together and try and push this research to go forward. And then we have My Jubilee Trust that's able to go out, find the money, give it to us to do the work, and then have the fantastic opportunity to meet all together, clinicians, families, researchers, all together and discuss. And I think we're really quite unique and lucky to have that experience. So thank you for supporting us and everyone here. And if anybody wants to contact me at any stage, here's my email address, feel free. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Belinda. And thank you for showing my car. Vielen Dank, Belinda. Vielen Dank, dass du mein Auto gezeigt hast. Questions, questions. There must be one, at least. So it must have been very clear, Belinda, if there is no question. Well, not at all. <laughs> ah, here's one. Hi, hi, Belinda. Uh, is there no other problems associated with reducing DNM2 to, to such small levels? Uh, that's a really good question, and it's something we're very interested to look at. Um, so we we don't want to get rid of dynamo 2 in the cell. We know that it's important to be there. Um, what we're trying to do now is find the range that we can reduce it and have no effects in the cell, no negative effects. So we have mice now um, that we're reducing dynamo 2, and we're exploring all of the tissues in the body to see if we can find any negative effects from reducing dynamin 2 and so far we haven't found any. So we're going to keep exploring it um, by reducing dynamin 2 different ways and by looking at the mice for the full length of their life. But for now it looks very promising that it doesn't seem to be having a negative effect. Yeah, one question. Um, my question is how long um, is it until this can be tried on human patients? Uh, okay. so now we're trying to develop the approach that we can give to mice. Uh, if everything goes well, it could take three to five years to go from where we are now to get to clinical trials. If everything goes well. Um, did you... Um well, test the babies of the mouse with reduced dynamin 2. Um, did the kids of the mouse have any effects? So if we try and reduce dynamin 2 in the babies of the MTM1 mice? No, um, you said you reduced dynamin uh, 2. So um, did the mouse that has a longer life have babies by herself or by himself? Ah, that's, that's a really good idea. We haven't tried that. We haven't tried that. So they're healthy in every aspect, but we've never tried to take a rescued mouse and see if it can have babies. That's what you mean? Yeah, and yes. if the babies are affected or if it has any, well, no. side effects. Yeah, so that we haven't tried, but we could try it in the, the, in the lab to see if we can do that. Thank you. Are the results with the dogs? Uh, so the dogs would be the next step if we want to keep going. Um, so we need to develop first a product to give to the mice. If that works in mice, then we try in the dogs. If we see the same effect in the dogs, um, then generally what is done is you need to do a small trial to make sure the dosage is okay in a non-human primate, like a monkey or something, and then you can go to patients after that. So probably Anna and Casey will explain a little bit more about that because they're a bit more advanced. They'll have some really nice work in the dogs. But that's the general step to go from mice to patients. And, and if I can just add, so um, when you have dogs, a dog facility, we don't have a dog facility at the IGBMC. And this is something that is way more complicated uh, than to have a mouse facility. So if one day we will go over to the dogs, it will be not be possible to do it at the, at the IGBMC, but in collaboration with other people that's, that, have, that have a dog facility. The bigger the animal, the more expensive are the trials. Um, so in case uh, you would be in a few years um, that you could give the medicine to a person, would this person be a child or an older one? Uh, yes, yeah, so that's something that would need to be discussed before the clinical trials start. Um, and it's a very big discussion point. It's a very big discussion point from some trials. I've seen, uh, for example, SMA, it's a, a spinal muscular atrophy. Um, 
they got clinical approval to start in, in babies that were seven to nine months of age. And uh, they had fantastic results with that. So they progressively got approval to, to go younger and younger. And the earliest I saw them was around, I think, 27 day old baby that was treated by gene therapy. Um, yeah, a baby that was treated at 27 um, days old. So I think it's a case of what would be approved at first, then getting positive results to go earlier and earlier. The earlier they went, the better results they got, but then it's a case of um, what they seem is acceptable to start as a starting point. Great.